Africa. I went to eight different countries and I visited with every Filipino missionary and their work that they have been establishing for many years. I bring you a report this morning that your fellow missionaries, your fellow Filipinos are doing a good work in Africa. I, they have land, they have buildings, they have institutes, they have nationals that they're leading and training, they have vision that they are reaching their people, their areas for the cause of Christ. And they do also have a vision to, for world evangelism from Africa. They have a burden to see God do something there in their place. I also went through South, Af South Korea and saw the Pakli bars and the same report for them as well. A good job. If you're supporting them, your money is in the right place. If you're looking for a missionary to support in Africa, I recommend any one of those good men with their ministries that God has given to them. But the reason that Africa is a dark continent is because there is a great spiritual darkness in that country. Every country I visited, I was amazed at the fact that there were a great worship of devils and spirits in every country and almost every village that I was, was in. Witch doctors are very prevalent in the country. They are very feared also by the people. You can see if you're going through a, a uh, metropolitan area, you see a mud hut with a grass roof. That is a symbol of a witch doctor lives in that place. They're in Tanzania. Around the work of Jesse Tinson, there are three witch doctors close by him. One of them is very mad at Brother Jesse because Brother Jesse witnessed to his wife about receiving Christ as her personal savior. And they are busy casting different types of spells and, and uh, uh, trying to defeat the people there in their, their work. Brother Jesse has found many dead cats thrown over the bakod into their property. There's a curse connected to that. And they are doing what they can to destroy the work there in Tanzania by the power of, of Satan. Even the believers in, the, in Africa are very, very superstitious when it comes to spirits and demons and devils. If a woman has prayed for that her and her husband might have a child, if the woman becomes pregnant, she keeps it a secret and will not tell anyone until she is six or seven months along in her pregnancy because they are afraid. If Satan hears that I'm pregnant, he might come and steal away my baby. In Ghana, Brother Felix told me that when the high chief of the tribe passes away, that is the custom of the, of the tribe, that six men must have their heads cut off so that these six men can serve the, the chief of the tribe in the afterlife. I passed by the house of the, of the chief of the tribe where Brother Felix was living. A huge home, a huge complex. And he says, you know, you never know when the chief might die. But if you hear that he's sick, we all stay home. No one goes out at night. Because someone, when you finally know that the, that the priest is, that the, the chief is dead, you know there are six others who lost their life along the way as well. In Ghana, not far from the church that Brother Felix is pastoring, there is another Pentecostal church. And I found out that on Tuesdays they have a demon casting out service there in, in Ghana. And then when I went to Uganda, there was Satanero, I discovered that every Friday they have their demon casting out services in Uganda. So I determined that on Tuesday in Ghana, they cast out the demons and they would run over to Uganda. And then on Friday, they are cast out of Uganda and they run back over to Ghana. You must have some traveling days for the demons to take from place to place. There is darkness not only because of that, but because of their religion. 
Now there are large churches everywhere. In fact, there are, there are prophets and apostles and bishops in abundance in Africa. They advertise on the television. They have huge billboards in the city. Come to my church. I will bless you. But they say openly, if you are poor, do not come to my church. I only want rich people to come to my church. Because if you have a counseling or if you ask for a prayer, you must pay for the counseling. You must pay for the prayer or ask for the blessing from that pastor or that bishop or that uh, apostle of that church. Highly religious, highly in darkness. In the Congo, I stayed at a small hotel in Lumabashi as we were having the missions conference with Brother Fellow Silva. And then one morning there was a knock on the door of my hotel room. When I opened the door, there was a well-dressed woman there with another Congolese man and a young woman. And I said, what can I do for you? And the woman said, I hear that you are a man of God. And I want you to pray for me that I will be blessed. And so I shared with her the greatest blessing there is, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we pray. Africa is a very dark place. It's full of lost people and hopeless people. But what, but what I saw in the darkness was also many points of light. Filipinos and national pastors who are fearlessly shining the lights on a dark continent. The believers know, as you know very well yourself here, the, the shining of the light will defeat the darkness that is around us. The light is moving men and women in Africa to make decisions for the Lord. In Uganda, after preaching the morning service there with Brother Satanero, there were four of those men who surrendered their lives to full-time missions in Uganda. In fact, there was no country that I saw in Africa that would not be able to trust God as you have done to send the gospel from their place, from their church, anywhere around the world. In Kenya, in Nairobi, in the Bible college there, I spoke to 25 different pastors in Nairobi who have a vision for launching missions into South Sudan, in Tanzania, and also Uganda. In the Congo, with Dr. Felicilda during their first World Missions Conference. The cry of the pastors and the excitement of the people that gathered there in that church for that conference was a cry of missions for the world. There were 13 men who came forward in an invitation given by Brother Jack Baskin who were able to stand up before the congregation and tell us their name and the country that God had laid upon their heart that they would leave their country and go to the foreign field for missions. These, these who surrendered were for Angola and Zambia and Tanzania and Rwanda and Brunei and uh, Rwanda and Brazil. They were saying, we heard the cry, and we want to be a part of foreign missions. I went, to the, I went to Africa that I might tell them the Filipino story. And I shared with them on every pulpit what God has done in the islands of the Philippines. And without exception, every church, every pastor that we sat down with, whether it's over lunch or a coffee, they were excited about what God has done in the islands of the Philippines. There were these men who surrendered their lives. We will go to the foreign field. Fifteen other men came forward and said, we do not know where, but we are willing to do what God wants us to do in our lives. There were two pastors from Zambia who came to the conference in Congo. After the conference in Congo, there were four pastors from Congo that made their trip all the way into Livingstone, Zambia, that they might be a part of the conference there with Brother, with, uh, uh, 
Himada, these four pastors from Congo and these two pastors from Zambia had one message for those who would hear them, one message that they received from their heart and that they would bring to their, their people was simply this, missions, missions, missions. In Zambia, the missions conference, there were only over 80 pastors who came throughout the country. Even some from other countries came around to be a part, to hear a message on the Great Commission there in those conferences. These attenders heard the messages that were being preached about the Great Commission and God moved in the hearts of the men and the invitation. Seven Zambians came forward and said, here we are, we'll be a missionary wherever God wants us to be. These men now, these countries now are organizing their mission board. They are now organizing their clearinghouse. They're getting ready that they might launch out from Africa, wake up that sleeping giant, and reach out around the world with all of their vast resources and all their people that they might tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. They've seen what you have done, and they want to do what God has done in your life. If God is able for you, God is able for them. November 24th, I was in the small village in Zambia with Brother Kalibayan. He lives and works in a place called Shesheke. There were 85 very poor, poor people who came to his, attend his preaching service. I walked through the village that Sunday morning with Brother Kalibayan. And as we were walking on that dirt road, passing mud huts, Thatch roofs, bamboo walls. There were children who were running toward us and running past us, dressed up in their, their very best they had. And I said, Brother Kalibayan, where are these children going? He says, they're running to church, to Sunday school, to hear the gospel. We came back and saw these 65 young boys and girls who were hearing the gospel. And I went into the, the homes of those people in the village. They have no water. They have no electricity. Living in that, that mere condition. But at the end of the service after the preaching, there was one man who raised his hand and said, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. And I thought to myself, here is a man that lives in a mud hut. Here is a man whose roof is made of grass. But in eternity, his feet will be on the streets of gold. In Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, there with Brother Bankali, as I preached the message and ended up that midweek prayer meeting, there was a young boy that came and said, I want to be a missionary just like you. Will you pray for me? So I sat down beside him and I said, how old are you? And he says, I'm nine years old. I said, what is your name? He said, my, my name is Exodus. And so I prayed for Exodus. A nine-year-old boy who says, I want to be a missionary. I want to serve my God. I want to be the leader to bring the people in slavery out to freedom. Exodus. These stories that I can tell you can be repeated in every country, in every church that we were a part of. You see, Africa is a dark place with many lights that are shining for the Lord. The Apostle Paul lived in a very dark world as well. In fact, it was a first century church, and the church then did not look anything like we have a church here today. In fact, there was only a handful of believers in the first century church. And those believers that gathered together, they were considered rebels and needed to be destroyed because of what they were preaching and teaching during that time. So Paul, Saul, a Tarsus, decided that he would find a way to extinguish the light that was shining in the darkness. 
And Paul did his very best. The Bible says that he brought havoc amongst, amongst the church. And there was great persecution amongst the believers. And Paul was behind all that he was doing there. All of this went forth to destroy the light that was shining in the darkness. And it would seem that all the persecution, the light was going out. But the Bible says that these, pip, that these believers went everywhere preaching the gospel. This story is familiar to all of us this morning. The Apostle Paul is soon on his way to go to Damascus. He is going to find the believers that are there and he's going to bring them in the prison. He's going to punish them to death. And as he's traveling on his way to Damascus, the Lord appears unto Paul. And Jesus spoke to him. And the light brighter than the noonday sun shone around him. And he fell to his, to his, to his face on the ground and the Lord said, Why are you persecuting me, Saul? Isn't it hard for you? Isn't it difficult for you? You are trying to destroy the light? On that very day, the Apostle Paul was born into the family of God and he was delivered from his darkness into light. In Africa, we saw many who made that transformation from darkness to light in salvation. In Ghana, there was Brother, Brother Felix. He had over 300 people in his first anniversary for his church. A wonderful church, a beautiful church built there for the glory of the Lord. Over 300 people gathered together, over 80 first-time visitors. And at the end of the preaching and Brother Felix doing the interpretation, there were 20 who raised their hand and said, We want to know Christ as our personal Savior. In Uganda, in the Institute there in Lira, Brother Satanero set up a meeting that I might be able to speak to the students that were in the Institute of Laboratory Technology. And there was a class of 100 young people who were gathered together, who training for their, for their profession to be lab technicians and medical facilities. 100 students in a very small room and we opened up the word of God and preached to them Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5 and 6. At the end, Brother Satanero gave an invitation and 19 of those young people came forward and stood before all of their classmates and said the sinner's prayer. In that church the, on that Sunday, the Christ Biblical Bible Baptist Church where Brother Satanero pastors and Mom Ida Mungsungkai works together with the children and the women. There's a, a full house to hear the gospel preached. And there were many of those students there coming to hear again the gospel. And even the owner of the institute came in with his wife to hear the preaching. And 12 of those people stood up and said, we want to trust Christ as our Savior as well. In Lumabashi, Congo, at the invitation of Brother Baskin, there were 28 who said, I'm lost, but I want to be saved. God is able to pierce the darkness in no matter what country that they are in. And these are the Filipinos who are doing the work that you sent them to, to go. You provided for them. You support them and you pray for them. And they're doing a work that God is honored in. Now the Apostle Paul was on his own missionary journey from Antioch. The purpose statement of the Apostle Paul was very simple to follow. It was win the lost at any cost. And Paul poured the rest of his life into doing what God told him to do. In our text this morning in Acts chapter 26, another story that we are familiar with, Paul was standing before King Agrippa and he said, and he declared unto the king, I have not been disobedient unto that heavenly vision. And Paul gave the heavenly vision to King Agrippa, a threefold heavenly vision that will reach the world for Christ. He said, open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. 
That was Paul's threefold attack on the world around him to open their eyes. The Apostle Paul opened the eyes of Lydia there down by the riverside where had beaten him and thrown him into prison. And that jailer, when the earthquake came, he came in with a light to dispel the darkness around him, but he was still in darkness. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the darkness was replaced with light Amen. in the jailer. In the Apostle Paul's journey, even in Rome, he was able to turn darkness to light for those who lived in Caesar's, Caesar's household. For he said, all the saints of Caesar's household salute you. Open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light. The area of the Apostle Paul was in spiritual darkness. But Paul was on a, was on a, a journey to turn on the light. So Lystra and Derby and Iconium and Pamphylia was turned from darkness to light. The Thelonica, Berea, the regions of Galatia, Macedonia, Ephesus, Troas, Mysia was turned from darkness unto light. The Apostle Paul had finished his race. The world had been turned upside down by the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were turned from the darkness unto to light. The Apostle Paul said, My third thrust is that they would no turn from Satan's power unto God. That little damsel that was possessed by the demon that followed the Apostle Paul and Silas through the marketplace of Philippi, the one that would stand behind them and say, these are the servants of the Most High God. These are the servants of the Most High God. That young, young demon-possessed girl, she found out that the power of God was greater than the power of Satan. For now she was not saying, these are the servants. Now she could say, I and the servants of the Most High God. The natives on Malta, they saw the power of God greater than the power of Satan. When that serpent came out of the fire and lashed himself on the arm of the Apostle Paul and he flicked it over in the fire and he fell, did not fall down dead. The rulers there, the islands, and the uh, Publius, and the father that was sick with fever saw the power of God greater than all the witch doctors of the island when Paul came and prayed upon him and he was healed. And they brought all the sick unto him that he might touch them and pray for them. The apostle Paul was not disobedient to that heavenly vision. He had been, it had been the cry of the church. It is the cry of our church. It's the cry of every church that we would do what the Apostle Paul had done. Since God gave the great commission, that's been the cry for all of us. Others have taken that gospel message and have done what Paul said to do. In the, in the late 1800s, it was a, a missionary that went to an island that was inhabited by cannibals and savage, pagan people. He stayed there for many years in a hard struggle. He stayed there under great persecution, under threat of his life, in great struggles and frustrations. But the end of his life, he had stayed true to the heavenly vision. When he died, the natives took up his body I dug a hole there in the islands and they put his body in the grave. And they put a tombstone to mark the place of the missionary. And they wrote upon the tombstone this. When he came, there were no Christians. When he left, there were no heathens. In the Congo conference with Dr. Felicilda, 
There was a man who rode his bicycle five days to come and hear a message on the Great Commission. On the back of his bicycle was his wife. Five days pedaling his wife across Congo to come to a missions conference, sleeping in the bush along the side of the road. Not a very safe thing to do in Congo. There was also two men who came to the conference there in Lumabashi. These men had traveled seven days to come to the conference. One was Gustav and one was Major Smiley. Seven days to come and hear a message from the Word of God about missions, foreign missions. I'm telling you this morning, there is a stirring in Africa to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto the power of God. And that's what I want to tell you about this morning. And that's what I want to share my heart with you about what God has already done and what God is affecting in countries around the world and how you have been, been watched afar and they have had their eyes upon you and they've been looking at what God has done, how God is able to raise up the Filipino people, the Filipino churches, and to do what no one else has done for the cause of Christ, because God is able. Amen. So let me share, you, share with you this morning what is required for us to deliver them from darkness. Number one, your eyes must be open. You cannot show others what you cannot see yourself. Your eyes must be open. God wants your eyes to see what He sees. God wants you to see the needs of others. In John chapter 4, Jesus said to His disciples, lift up your eyes and look upon the fields, for they are white already on the harvest. God wanted Jonah to see what he saw in Nineveh. God wanted Jonah to see that there was 120,000 souls who knew nothing about God. But all that Jonah could see was his own needs and his own comfort. So he built a booth and a gourd that made him happy in the shade. And Jonah's spiritual eyes were certainly closed to the great needs of the lost world around him. May I make an observation this morning? And my observation is not one of rebuke. It is one of exhortation. It is one that comes from the heart of a man who has come to your country and has seen what God has done, and to see what God is doing, and to see what God is going to do. So hear my words this morning, and hear what my heart has to say. It would seem to me, the Filipino is closing their eyes. It appears to me that we're moving in the wrong direction. Where are the Filipinos? Where are the Filipino families that are needing to surrender? Where are the ones who are standing up and say, I'll fill in the gap? Let me just tell you, for the past two years, the, 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 the number of the missionaries in the Asian Baptist Clearinghouse has been static. This year, it's minus one. Last year, in February 2013, only one Filipino family stood up and stepped forward for missions. We opened the field of Mozambique. 
Then in July of 2013, still only one Filipino family, husband and wife, stood up and said, we will go to the Burmese people along the border. Yes, there were two single girls as well. One to China, one to Indonesia, and one Cambodian man, Brother Nun Rata, who were, who were interviewed and added to ABC. This year, Monday, February the 17th, 2014, there was one Vietnamese man who was interviewed and accepted to be able to use the clearinghouse as his service center. But there was no Filipino. Nineteen ninety four, Brother Lloyd Baker had the vision to start the Asian Baptist Clearing House. You honored him last night and thank you so much for that. Twenty years this year, two decades, twenty years, and this is the first time in any interview with the ABC board that a Filipino has not stood up and said, I'm ready. I'll sacrifice it all. I'll leave my country. I'll leave my family. I'll leave my church. I'll leave my loved ones. I'll leave my culture. I'll leave my language. And I will go to the foreign field because God has called me and I know that he can take care of me and I know I can follow him. And I, but there's no one. I'm sure there's maybe some in the shadows. I'm sure there are others who are in the process of coming through. Oh, praise God for that. But I'm wondering, where are you? Where are the Filipinos? Where are the families who will give their, their life and all that they have? Like Brother Andala said, here's my lunch. Here's my family. I give it all to you. There's no, no one this year thus far. July coming up and only five months away, we're praying God give us Filipinos to come up again for the Asian Baptist Clearing House to be presented and be a missionary going to the foreign field. The Lord is blessed. Oh, listen, let me tell you, God is still blessing the Philippines. God is still moving in your church and with your people. Your people's faith is still growing and they are still sacrificing and their faith promise missions giving and churches are, are doing all they can. Let me tell you, at this last year, 2013, that there was a 10% increase over 2012 in the giving of the Filipino churches. You know, we, we, are, we, we hit the mark of 59.3 million pesos for world missions last year. We went from 109 churches, I'm sorry, 809 churches to 843 churches who were giving to foreign missions last year. An increase of 32 churches. Writing receipts for those who have come in went up by 8% to over 7,500 receipts going out of the office thanking people for giving to missions. But let me ask you the question. What is money without men? God has given us the four M's of missions. The masses. There's seven billion of them. And the majority of them are lost. God gave the message. Jesus saves. Simple enough. God gave the money because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But there's only one thing he cannot give. And that's the men. Because you must give yourself. 
Your will must be broken. Your vision must be open. Your eyes must see what God sees before you can step into the arena of missions, whether it's local or foreign, whatever God leads you to go. But what is money and what is all of this without men to take the message to the masses? Where are the future Filipino national leaders to stand up and say, we will fill the gap. Who will take the place of Brother Baker after 55 years? Who will fill his shoes? Who will stand up and say, I am here to take your place? We're looking for these men, these women who will do what God tells them to do. Are we going backwards in missions? This is not the time to go backwards. This is the time to open our eyes, not have our eyes closed. The eyes of Jesus were always open. The Bible says, when he saw the multitude, his eyes were, his heart was moved with compassion. When he saw, Jeremiah says in Lamentation chapter 7, my heart, my eyes affected my heart when I saw the daughters of the city. Oh God. It is time to get our, our hearts affected. It's time to open the eyes and see what God is doing in your churches, why he is doing it, what God is doing in our nation, what God is doing around the world. We need to see and have our hearts touched by the power of God. There, there are 34 countries in sub-Sahara Africa that are open to the gospel. They're waiting for someone to come and to preach the gospel unto them. Liberia and Ghana and Nigeria, and Ivory Coast, and Angola, and Zimbabwe, and Botswana, and Rwanda, and Burundi, and Zambia, and Madagascar, and Zanzibar, Namibia, uh, all of these countries, they are not just names on a map. They are the cry of the Great Commission. Come over and help us. But who is going to rise up? Who is going to be, no longer be com complacent where they are, but the Spirit of God stirs them up like the eagle stirs up the nest that they cannot stay. They must go forward. They must step out and say, God, if you want me and my family, we'll go to any place you send us. Not just Africa, but Southeast Asia is still crying, come over and help us. Central and South America is still needing Filipino missionaries to go to tell the gospel unto them. The 1040 window is still looking for someone to come and share the gospel unto them. It's time for our eyes to be open, reopened to what God is going to do in the Filipino islands. I'm going to cut my sermon short. When I was in Tanzania, there was a man by the name of Jovan, one of the key workers of Brother Jesse Tinson. And he said at the last service, he stood up and he says, I have a request to make. He says, here's my request. Please, Brother Byers, go back to the Filipino islands. And first of all, tell them, thank you for sending a missionary to us. Secondly, Brother Byers, please tell the Filipino people, don't stop praying for us in Africa. And thirdly, he said, please, please send more missionaries to Africa. We look around us today, my dear friend, and we have seen the prosperity of God's hand upon our churches.
you did not furnish, and fields that you did not plant, and wells that you did not dig, that you do not forget God. Perhaps the blessings of the Lord have been too good on you. And you're sitting back and enjoying the good blessings of God. Siguro malabo yung mata mo. Siguro bulag na. It's time to say, God, I want to have the scales removed from my eyes. I want to see what I saw 10 years ago. I want my heart to be affected by the call of God on my heart for missions. And God, I want to surrender to do what you want me to do. God, I'll give my life. I'll go to South America. I'll go to Africa. I'll go to the 1040 window. I'll do whatever you want me to do. But God, the Filipino people must rise up. You must rise up and hear what God has told us to do. Don't let the testimony of this great nation and what God has done be hindered or tarnished by Satan's lullaby. May God help us as we challenge you. You will challenge your people and your Bible college students. Open your eyes to the world. Be ready to step forward. Be a missionary. And then support with all your heart, soul, and mind. And God will continue to bless this great nation of the Republic of the Philippines. Brother Jerry, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Byers.